Hello guys, uh, in this uh, lecture we are going to discuss uh, bearings and um, what I recommend is uh, that you read chapter 11 in our book uh, and that chapter basically will go in details in all types of bearings. Uh, uh, so uh, we'll begin first of all by explaining what is a bearing made of. Um, uh, so essentially uh, the bearing is made of an inner race uh, which is uh, this guy that you see on the inside and an outer race and um, bearings could be uh, they could use different rolling elements such as balls uh, rollers uh, you have uh, cylindrical rollers or conical rollers and we are going to discuss all of these in a minute um, the bearing is used to uh, take on uh, all types of loadings um, uh, such as radial uh, thrust load or a combination of radial and thrust and uh, the bearing is supposed to take all these loads while being efficient in the sense where you know transmitting rotations between uh, the two uh, the inner race and the outer race without resulting in excessive friction all right so this is um, uh, this is a bearing right here um, so I'm going to draw just this is a basic uh, radial So that is uh, the cross section of the bearing, right? And so this is your inner race, and that is the outer race. Obviously, we are going to have a shaft, right? And then I'm going to basically to continue. That bearing would look like that. And obviously this guy is part of this. And here we have the ball, right? And then now I'm gonna draw the outer race on this end. So it's gonna look like this. And ideally this guy is gonna be constrained into another structure here, right? So this guy is gonna be fixed and this guy is going to be fixed, right? So the bearing is constrained on both ends and then the shaft is capable of rotating. And we have uh, different types of forces that are going to be applied. So the first one is a radial load, right? And I'm gonna draw it like R, right? You have a radial load that could be applied on this guy, either up or down. <clears throat> and the other type of loading is called the thrust. And this guy, that force is a thrust force. The thrust force basically is trying to move this guy down on this end, right? And sometimes the thrust force can basically uh, disassemble the bearing if that thrust force is large. So, uh, so that is uh, that is the basic configuration of a basic bearing. Um, let's continue on with our uh, discussion over here. And the inner radius is called the bore. Um, and sometimes, uh, basically, the row um, or uh, the balls basically are constrained using this item which is called a separator and the separator is used to maintain the distance between the balls and to allow basically um, some area for uh, lubrication or grease uh, uh, to continue to self-lubricate the bearing essentially. Um, so this is a typical um, you know a cross-section sort of uh, this is a ball and then this is the inner race and in reality uh, bearing design is a uh, a trade-off between friction and large load, right? Uh, so the bearing, if the bearing can take a very large load, it means that you are going to have more friction inside the bearing, and if the bearing will take lower load, then you're going to have less friction inside the bearing. And the reason for this basically depends on the contact that we have. So in this case, what we have over here, we have a, a point contact right so this area right here we have a point contact between this ball and then the inner race and the ball contact basic or i'm sorry the point contact between these two elements uh, it will result in very high stresses at that contact zone but at the same time it's going to result in low friction because the surface is also very small right um so some of the things that uh, you are going to be analyzing if you are, you know, designing a bearing or if you're analyzing the bearing is going to be, you know, uh, fatigue, 
uh, friction, heat, corrosion, material properties, duplication, tolerances of uh, uh, between you know the inner race and the outer race, cost and the noise. And obviously, we're not going to be going into these in details. Uh, we are going to mainly be discussing in our course is the life of the bearing and the load that the bearing can take, the radial load that the bearing can take. Okay, as I mentioned, so when you have a point contact, essentially you are going to have high stresses, low friction. So this is uh, this means low conformity. So high, if you have a point contact, you have high stress, low friction, and then low loads, and then high conformity, basically where we have uh, essentially a line contact. Uh, that would be in the case of not a ball. Instead, you would have basically a cylindrical roller or a conical roller. And in that case. You are going to have a larger contact zone, you would have higher friction, but at the same time, your bearing can take larger loads. So these are the bearings that you would typically find, for example, in your car rotor, in your transmissions, etc. All right, so, uh, <clears throat> so bearings could, uh, the race of the bearing itself could be like, for example, deep groove bearing where the inner race is a, essentially will have a very deep groove and this would enable the bearing to take higher thrust loads for example all right um, in addition to the radial load so the primary function of the radial ball bearing is obviously to take the radial load which is what is shown here but then again the deep raceway right allows you to uh, this guy right so the deep raceway will allow you to essentially take uh, thrust loads, right? And I'm gonna come back to my video where I could show you this. Um, let me do this, all right. So this is, you know, a regular radial ball bearing, but if this guy was a deeper groove, it means that your race is gonna be like that, right? So that would be, for example, my inner race. And the ball would be like, for example, like sitting all the way here. And let's say this is your top race. So in that case, basically that bearing is stuck here, right? And this probably like should go like to the middle, right? And then you actually have more. So this guy here is a deep groove, right? And this would prevent this guy from like, you know, popping in this direction and therefore it would be able to resist thrust loads more right and obviously you know when you are doing that you are again adding more friction to your system and um, you know in motion control when you have friction in your system it becomes a little bit more difficult to control your system uh, you could have like you know servo motor application where you have bearings involved etc all right so um, if you ever imagined how a bearing is actually put together so these are the steps for putting a bearing together. And uh, you start by putting uh, the two races like this, the inner race and the outer race. And you have a machine basically where the balls are positioned in this uh, orientation. And then this guy is pushed up and that you have the bearing. And then finally the last step is where they put the cage or uh, the separator for the balls. There are different types of bearings um, like double row bearings. Uh, these bearings can obviously take larger radial capacity and these bearings are usually used in you know aerospace applications and uh, applications where you have very large radial load and these also um, some um, double row bearings are actually used for uh, self-alignment as we're going to we're going to see in a second um, in general <clears throat> um, Bearings can come in, you know, different configurations. Sometimes you can get a frameless bearing where you actually uh, install it in your application. Uh, sometimes you just buy it as a complete packaged system. Um, so in this case, we have uh, these are shield uh, ball bearings. So this guy is, shield, is shielded from loads and you know forces that may damage the balls. Again, this guy is shielded and this guy is sealed. Basically, this prevents air and uh, dust from penetrating inside the bearing raceway and potentially causing damage to the race. Um, 
And uh, this is a typical uh, shielding arrangement. So here you have one shield on this end. Sometimes you could have two shields. Uh, you could have one shield, you have two seals, you have shield and a seal at the same time. And this guy is a snap ring. And the snap ring, for example, is used to uh, either snap a bearing into a housing or a board, etc. All right. Uh, what is also very important bearings are radial ball bearings. Um, uh, I'm sorry, angular ball bearings. And this is an angular ball bearing. An angular ball bearing basically is most of the time used where you have load coming from only one side. So, um, and let me actually throw a radial ball bearing, or I'm sorry, angular ball bearing. So the angular ball bearing is meant to take load on one direction. And most of the time, angular ball bearings as are used in combo. For example, you'd have two angular ball bearings and um, the arrangement in which that implemented, it's called you know back-to-back -back or cross type angular ball bearing. And I'm gonna show you how. So let, let us draw a cross section of an angular ball bearing. So this is a ball, right? And this is the outer race will basically look like that. And then it's gonna come here. This is one end of it, and then the other end is gonna be on this side. It's gonna look like that, right? And the other portion of it, so is gonna be, let's say this is the other wall, right? And uh, so this guy is gonna look like that. And this guy is going to look like this. So this is, for example, your shaft is gonna be here. And this is the part of the shaft. This is, uh, uh, this is your, 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 uh, your outer race. And obviously, like I said, the outer race can be, is usually connected somewhere like that in a board and basically this guy can rotate. So now what happens is that this bearing actually, if you try to apply a thrust force on here, right? And I'm gonna call this T, that force basically is gonna be the, uh, reacted upon by two forces that look like that, right? And the force from this ball on this, uh, you know, sub assembly, which is holding your shaft is gonna look like that, right? So the angular ball bearing can essentially take thrust loads, right? But what is the problem with the angular ball bearing is you cannot actually put it alone, right? Instead, um, so for example, if you actually had a thrust force from this end, you know you're gonna basically pop out the bearing, right? So what actually happens is usually that bearing will actually have a, when it's done in a back-to-back -back arrangement, uh, so this force basically is going to be done, is going to be restrained by another bearing and then that bearing will actually be like this over here. And this is just to show how that would look like. So let me increase this guy. So let's say you have, this is your other bearing and uh, this guy would look like that. Let me just make this a little bit bigger so it actually touches on here. Right, so that's this shot could be like bigger. So now, if I actually try to apply a force like that, this guy is gonna restrain it, right? And obviously, I'm going to have something that is symmetrical on this end, right? So this is the angular ball bearing. So as a single as a single bearing, right? If you try to apply a thrust force like that, it's gonna resist it. But again, if you apply a force like that, you have to actually have another bearing, and that bearing basically will take that load. Right. Obviously, like I said here, that would be the image, the symmetry of this guy is gonna be on this end to connect on this board. Uh, usually when you buy an angular ball bearing, you actually buy it as components. So you buy this component alone or this component, you're gonna this component alone and then this component alone. And you actually integrate the angular ball bearing in your structure. And the angular ball bearings, when you have an arrangement like a back-to-back -back arrangement, basically it's gonna make a very strong design. Essentially now, not only can take on the force, but you can actually take a moment on the shaft. So you can actually put a moment on the shaft and this moment is gonna be restricted by forces on this guy and on this guy. Uh, all right, let me just like redraw this uh, uh, very quickly. So if I have a shaft, 
right? And if I want to put like two angular ball bearings, basically this guy is going to look like this. And this guy is going to look like that. And on here, it's going to look like this. And then this guy is going to look like that. So this is your inner race, right? So this is the same part, and then this is the same part, right? Now you get that bearing, and then it's going to be here. And this guy is going to look like that. Right, so this is what you are going to have after you put those bearings, and then these two basically are essentially are going to be on the same shaft. And then this guy is going to be on the same shaft. Okay, so this will make a very uh, rigid arrangement for this shaft. So this shaft cannot move in any direction, and you can also apply a bending moment on it. Right, so it can take forces in this direction, like, and then a thrust force. Right, so it can take thrust, it can take gradual, and then it can also take moment. Uh, so this is why they like this arrangement. And then by spacing these out further, you can actually take even more moment on this bearing or on a shaft. Okay, uh, now let us go and discuss other type of thrust bearing. So there are bearings that whose functions are specifically thrust loads, right? And then this is a case of a purely thrust bearing. And these are, like I said, they are designed to carry uh, pure thrust load. And it would look like that, basically. You can see the arrangement. So it's like a radial ball bearing that is inverted, right? Uh, so the force is going to be from here, and it's going to be taking that load on this end. There are different types of thrust bearing, like such as conical ball bearings, which I'm going to go over in a second, um, like these guys. So, and these fall under the category of roller ball bearings. So what I've been discussing earlier regarding the angular ball bearings and the radial ball bearings, uh, they are, I'm calling radial ball bearing, right? Or an angular ball bearing. So the ball here, like the, the middle word basically, is specifying the rolling element inside the bearing. Instead of, you know, radial ball bearing, for example, you can actually have radial roller bearing, right? Which is this guy here. So that is a radial roller bearing. And the main advantage of a roller is, like I mentioned earlier, you have a bigger contact. In this case, it's a line contact. And by having a larger contact zone, you can have more forces. Why? Because a bigger area, bigger contact area means you have lower stresses, right? You know, the stress is force over area. The area is larger, the stress is reduced. Therefore, you can actually carry more force. And these are used in, you know, large equipments, you know, excavators, etc., and even robotic applications where you have larger loads. You could have a an angular roller bearing, right? So before we discussed an angular uh, ball bearing, now it's an angular roller bearing, and therefore this guy can take, uh, uh, you know, loads in, the, you know, thrust direction and also radial direction. But again. In this case, if you come in and then if you try to actually uh, put a force on this guy like that, you can pop up the bearing, right? And then you can damage the bearing or, um, you know, it may need to be uh, repaired later. So that bearing has to have, can only take force in one direction. And then if you want to make that bearing to take force in the other direction, then you have to mount it in a arrangement, which is called back-to-back, -back, like the one that I just showed you earlier, okay? Back-to-back -back or a cross arrangement. Um, you can also use a, a roller ball bearing, right? Or in this case, a roller. The conical is also called actually a roller. Um, so here you have a thrust roller bearing, right? And then that guy can take all types of forces in addition to forces that could, you know, somehow, you know, that angle can actually be offset in all directions. So now, so we have roller bearings. Now we said, I'm sorry, we said ball bearings. Now I just described roller bearings and uh, these guys are the roller bearings. Now we're going to go over needle ball bearings. 
So, so there are needle board bearings. These are, you know, precision bearings, and these are used in, you know, highly, you know, intricate applications, you know, in aerospace or, you know, even robotics or, you know, surgical robotics, like what people are working on right now, uh, where you need to have really precision elements. Um, people use needle ball bearings. And the reason why it's called a needle ball bearing is basically uh, it has, so instead of the roller, when the roller is actually becomes very small, now it's called a needle ball bearing. So the only difference between a needle ball bearing and a uh, roller ball bearing is that the needle is very tiny compared to the roller. And usually when they uh, implement a needle ball bearing, basically you put the housing and then the last thing that you do is actually you, you put the needles. So the needles are bought separately and they build the bearing on the application itself. So you put the arrangement, you put the assemblies, etc. And then the last thing that you actually put is you start to put those needles. Uh, obviously not in over, after the machine, but you know, sometimes in a subcomponent of a car or a gearbox, etc. You have, uh, you know, fixtures that hold uh, the inner races and the outer races together and then the needles are being put later you know using for example a robot or some uh, instrumented uh, uh, assembly systems and again needle ball bearings will have the same advantage as roller ball bearings by having larger contact zone in between so self-aligned self-aligning bearings is sometimes our inner shaft and that, that could be some misalignments between the inner shaft and the outer shaft uh, like in this case which I had um, let me just bring up my video so for example in this case right this guy cannot take any any misalignments right let's say this shaft actually is used to drive you know some other components over here right and here you actually have some forces. So this bearing arrangement is not, not actually meant to take that. Obviously it's meant to resist it, right? But if you actually have a huge deformation over here, that deformation is gonna be carried here and it's gonna create some forces on these bearings which will reduce the life of these bearings as we are going to see in a second. But sometimes if you actually want to have a little bit of play in your system or, or some room for uh, things to move in your system, basically without without basically transferring that moment over to your bearings you would have you do you'd like to actually have some misalignments and you don't want to put a coupler then you can use these self-aligning bearing but although self-aligning bearings are not heavily used um, um, in industry but uh, they are available uh, for those that would like to actually uh, use them so uh, so sometimes if you don't want to use this you want to use directly a that bearing uh, then these are called self-aligning bearing and then they would actually allow rotation, uh, relative uh, angular rotation between the inner shaft and then the outer shaft. Um, obviously replacements for these would be, you know, uh, you know, couple, uh, flexible coupling uh, or universal joints such as this one. Uh, it allows rotation uh, between the two shafts and it also allows misalignments between the two shafts. So like I mentioned, uh, sometimes you don't want the misalignment to result in, you know, to trying to like twist your assembly or create excessive loads on the balls, etc. So the, the easier approach to this is to use like, you know, couplers like that on your shaft. And then this is what is basically used sometimes in your drive shaft in your car. All right, now let us look at uh, the fatigue or how are we, uh, how are we are going to analyze the bearing life in our course. All right, so the way that we are going to analyze bearing life is gonna be based on pitting and pitting uh, is this. So after loading the bearing a lot, um, if you apply a large force on your bearing or if you uh, drive the bearing beyond its life, then you are going to start develop, to develop pitting in your bearing. Usually pitting are, bearings are made from steel that is very hardened and also, you know, a precision ground, meaning it's a very precision surface. And uh, it's very hard to actually break the bearing itself. Instead, you are going to damage the surface of the bearing. And this is what is typically used. It's very rare that the bearing will basically snap, right? What will happen is that this race, like I said, it will develop pitting and then you can 
uh, turn it for maintenance where they regrind this and then they polish that surface and then they give you they polish the rollers and then you can use the bearing again so when you say that uh, this bearing has failed is when you have a pitting area that is larger than 0 0.01 inch square so you have area that is a 0 0.01 inch when you when you can measure any you know uh, damage on the bearing that is uh, on you know the caliper that is larger than 0 0.01 in either direction and the rating life of the bearing is when 90 percent of a group of bearings that will uh, that will fail uh, well that will develop the spitting evidence meaning that essentially like 90 percent of or um, 90 percent risk of failing that that failing that bearing. and i'm going to show you how we are going to analyze that and it's actually very simple um, so uh, this is a typical uh, life uh, diagram for a bearing and um, what we are going to have is uh, we are going to have this l10 which is where 90% uh, of the bearing will actually last a, under a given under a given load and um, i'm going to actually come back here and i want to show you the equation that we are going to use, that you are going to use is um, a pretty straightforward so we are going to say f which is the radial load on the bearing multiplied by l which is the number of cycles not hours cycles that the bearing can last to the power one a and this guy will always be constant meaning that if you increase the radial load on the bearing so let me like kind of redraw the bearing again so let's say this is your inner race uh the ball is here and then this is you know very brief diagram on this okay all right let's say this is your radial load applied on the bearing f l is the number of cycles that the bearing can last and a is equal to three for ball bearings so all the ball bearings that are discussed including angular ball bearings and a is going to actually be equal to 10 over 3 which is 3.33 for um, roller bearings so roller conical etc you are going to use this value for a so this uh F times L, one over A is constant, meaning that if you actually increase the force on the radial, uh, the radial force, basically your life is gonna reduce, right? And if you increase your life, then your force is going to reduce, right? Um, uh, and because this guy is equal to a constant, the manufacturer will actually supply you by the rated force and the rated number of cycles. So here's what we'll do. We're gonna say my F, times L1 over A is gonna be equal to my rated force and my rated life and number of cycles. And then you can use this equation to actually, so let's say you, you, know, you are looking up a bearing and then they tell you that that bearing is rated for you know, 500, let's say FR is equal to 500 pounds. So the bearing is rated for 500 pounds and then LR is usually 10 to the six, you know, 1 million cycles. Now you can actually use this to calculate your F uh, for a given L. So let's say you, in your application, your bearing, you have your FD, right? So let's say your FD is equal to 300 pounds. So your desired force is 300 pounds. Now you can actually solve for your desired life. So if you're, you know, for this bearing that you look up from this from a catalog was like this, you have 300 pound force that you desire to actually put on here then you can actually solve how long that bearing is going to last and then obviously if fd is lower than that then you are going to last more than 10 to 6 cycles but this is the equation that you use if a is a ball bearing then you're going to use three if a is i'm sorry if the bearing is a roller bearing then you are going to instead of three you are going to use 3.33 so this is the equation that we're going to use all right and obviously because because bearings are you know rotating components then you can replace l right so the rated uh so if if it wasn't given to you in cycles 
uh, it would be given to you in RPM. So uh, RPM, revolution per minute, you have to multiply that by 60. So 60 times the rated speed, and R is in RPM, rated speed, right? Then this guy is going to be multiplied by how much? Okay, so uh, if um, sometimes they actually give you the number or the life, they give you the life in, in hours, right? So when they give you the life in hours, you actually have to multiply it by, um, by uh, 60 times, uh, times revolutions per minute, right? So 60 times revolution per minute, you are going, so this guy is gonna give you how much? It's gonna give you revolution per hours, right? So you actually have to multiply this guy by the, num the life in hours, right? So LR in hours, and this whole thing basically is gonna be in cycles, right? So this is why you see <clears throat> we have 60 times an R times a lot. So always when life, if life is given to you in cycles, then this whole thing is gonna be L in cycles, right? But if they gave you the rating life or the rated life of the bearing in hours, right? Uh, if they give you that and they have to give you the rated speed of that bearing, right? So rated speed of that bearing multiplied by rated life of the bearing in hours multiplied by 60, right? You're gonna get the rated life and cycles. All right, so uh, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna do uh, one example and uh, we're going to uh, wrap up this, to uh, this topic uh, basically. So let me share my screen again. And uh, in this example, we have a, an application or a bearing application where the bearing has to support or has to uh, withstand 500 pound load while operating at 150 RPM for thousand hours of life. Remember guys, life of the bearing is not in hours, it has to be in cycles for you to, for you to apply the equation. Uh, choose a bearing from the following. So, you know, you go on a catalog, or, you know, online catalog, and then you can look up these various bearings. So the first bearing has a thousand hours rated life. It has a rated speed of 200 RPM. It has a rated load of uh, 400 pounds and its price is $20. Another bearing, it has the following characteristics, etc. So we have to select the bearing from the following based on our application. So how are we going to do that? So uh, just like what I mentioned, uh, let me, is this okay so how are we going to do that so we said uh, we can use our equation right which which relates the load with the life so we said f l 1 over a is going to be equal to my rated load my rated life 1 over a and uh, if L here has to be in cycles. If F was in hours, as is the case of this problem, right? My desired force multiplied by L, my desired life, which is going to be equal to 60, multiplied by my desired speed, multiplied by desired life in hours, which is actually provided. Let me actually uh, make this guy bigger. Let me stop this is gonna be equal to my dated load multiplied by 60 NR LR one over A. So in this example, basically what we know is we know our, we know our F desired is equal to 500. We know our end desired is going to be equal. Our desired speed basically is equal to how much? Uh, 150 RPM. And then we have our desired life it is 1000 hours. So what we're, we're going to do is basically we can actually solve for the rated force, right? Why? Because so you have, so for a given desired, uh, values of force and then life and this guy has rated and for given rated characteristics of a bearing we can actually solve for the rated load and if that rated load is lower than what the bearing uh, catalog rated force 
then it means that this won't work, right? It has to be greater than the rated bearing of the, the bearing that we have. So basically, I'm going to end up with FR is going to be equal to, so uh, F desired, right? So this guy over this guy, so 60 will actually cancel out. ND multiplied by LD divided by NR times LR, right? And this guy is 1 over A. So what that really means is here you are solving for the rated load of the bearing that you are going to be buying, right? So you have this guy is, is specified from your application and then this guy is specified from your application and NR, LR are from the application, are from the bearing. You're basically solved for FR, right? And if FR is greater than, um, than FR10, which is from the catalog, it means that you know, the rated is going to be lower than or whatever that you are going to buy. So that won't work, right? So that, this FR has to be greater than this value for that bearing to work. So I'm going to come back and then um, discuss that in, in a little bit more detail from this, uh, from, uh, from here. Okay, so uh, coming back to this example. So like I said, <clears throat> You can solve for that rated force based on this, the equation that I just wrote, and uh, uh, which is this guy right here, right? And uh, here, basically, I'm solving for the rated force that the bearing which I'm buying should actually have, right? So I want to apply this for all the equations or for all the categories, right? In the first situation, basically. Um, I'm putting, uh, so all that I'm doing here, basically, my F desired will always be 500, right? All that is actually changing here is um, my rated life and my rated speed, right? So uh, basically 200 and 1,000, right? So in the first case, basically, uh, you are changing, like I said, this, these two values, and I'm solving for the rated load. Rated load for the first bearing is going to be 454 pounds. Um, and if you actually look at the actual bearing, how much can it withstand? It actually can only it can uh, take 400 pounds, right? So this guy can take 400 pounds, but it actually needs to withstand 454. So the first bearing actually is inadequate, right? The second bearing, basically, if you solve for the rated uh, force of that bearing is going to be 511. And the third one is going to be 447. So you can actually see that the second one is a slightly more. So the requirements from that bearing, it actually should take, that bearing specification should actually take 511 pounds on your rated to be a good bearing. And in this case, it is, um, it is the bearing that you are going to buy is 500. So that 500 actually needs to be this for the bearing to be good. And it's slightly below, so it's marginally inadequate. And the third one, basically, the bearing can take uh, 450, where it actually needs only to take 447. So it's it's adequate. But again, if you actually look at the prices, you see that the last bearing is much more expensive than this one. And then the middle bearing, where the middle bearing is almost adequate. Okay, guys, so this is uh, what, um, this is what bearings are about. And then this is how you should evaluate bearing space on this. So basically, you simply solve for a rated load of the bearing, right? And then if that rated load is greater than what the bearing can take, it means that the bearing is not adequate, right? It actually has to be less than the rated load of the bearing for this to work. This is a simple drawing of a bearing and uh, some of the important stuff when you are buying a bearing are tolerances. And uh, what I showed you earlier, guys, in uh, where I had that bearing arrangement, uh, you know, whether it is, you know, back to back or a single radial ball bearing, you always have to look at the tolerances. And uh, I'm going to reopen this from here. And so this is a bearing, right? Uh, you have two bearings over here and that dimension over here from here to here, right? Usually when they manufacture the bearing, that dimension actually is going to have some tolerance on it, right? So it won't be exactly, you know, like two inches or three inches. It's going to be two plus 0 0.01 inches or minus 0 0.001 inches, right? So you are going to have a play on here. And uh, that is very important when you are, you know, sizing up your application or when you are actually developing the application. Okay. So here you see that that bearing actually 
has no extra dimension, right? So uh, if this were to fit in a board, it will actually be easier to fit, or it will actually be a, a slight fit where it is slightly smaller than the value of the board. Similarly, on the inner board, basically the hole is smaller. It tends to be smaller than 0 0.5 inches. So tolerances are extremely important in bearings. And here you see that uh, in the bearing, basically sometimes they give you the maximum speed. They gave you uh, APDC rating. So this guy, um, uh, they have a temperature. You have ABC rating basically is the, uh, you can look this up in a table and then give you some information about some, you know, material properties, et cetera, in that bearing, which is obviously beyond what we're doing. Radio load, load capacity is what we are actually dealing with, right? So this is your static load is 530, and then this is in the case of a dynamic load, meaning that if that F is actually fluctuating, if F is static, meaning you have the load and then the load is dead, that dynamic is basically the car. This bearing is basically holding, you know, your your drive shaft or your you know, your differential gearbox. Okay, uh, what's tolerance? So all these you know parameters you would basically need in the case of uh, you know when you're analyzing the bearing. Uh, bearing type obviously it's ball here. Load direction is radial. So meaning that this bearing is not actually meant for thrust loads, right? So this is uh, also important as well. All right, guys, so the last example here that we have is on a roller bearing, and this is actually a roller, and we said when you have a roller, basically, you are going to do F times L, power on array, where A basically is equal to 10 over three, and this is a very simple example. We have a roller bearing that has a rated life of 500, 5,000 hours at 3,000 RPM, so automatically, you always want to multiply 5,000 by 300 by 60, right, to get the actual life of the bearing and cycles. And the catalog radial load of four pounds, how many hours will the bearing last if it is loaded at 100 pounds and then 250? You just apply the equation, right? And from this equation, basically, you can solve for your desired life. In this case, it would be 233 hours. So I encourage you guys, you do this example on your own uh, without me walking you through it because it's a very basic equation. And then here, all you are doing is you are solving for your desired, right? Desired number. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're. How many hours will the bearing last if it is loaded? Yeah, so, you're, so basically, solving for that desired number of, of hours, uh, you have your rated number of hours, you have your rated speed, you have your um, rated load, 40 pounds, right? And uh, and and that is uh, that is really it, guys.